What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about esophagitis. Before we get started, please take a quick second, go down the description box below. We got a link to our website. I'm telling you, we got some great notes and illustrations, things that I think will be super critical to, for helping you guys understand this topic. Go check it out. Also, if you guys like this video, you benefit from it, it makes sense, please support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. All right, also, Esophagitis, what is it? It's inflammation of the esophagus. We ain't noobs, we know this stuff, right? So there's something that's inflaming the esophagus. There could be a ton of reasons why, we'll discuss that in detail. But the basic concept is you're really, really inflaming the esophagus. Now when you inflame the esophagus, what are the common clinical features that patients with esophagitis will present with? The most common presentation of really just jacking this area up is it can lead to what's called dysphagia. So this is kind of difficulty with swallowing. It can lead to very significant pain with swallowing. This is probably one of the big common features. It's called odynophagia. Odynophagia, this is painful swallowing. And the last one, which is actually pretty common as well, is because your esophagus is inflamed, it's gonna burn, it's gonna hurt. And the pain areas it typically tend to be in the chest, so we call this retrosternal chest pain, it's like heartburn, or it's near the epigastrium, and this can be dyspepsia. So watch out for things like heartburn, kind of that sensation, if you will, or dyspepsia. These are pretty common symptoms associated with this. All right. Now, the next thing I want you guys to think about is what are the complications associated with esophagitis? So if you tear up the esophagus, you inflame that thing up, what are the problems with that? Well, with chronic, chronic, chronic inflammation and significant inflammation, that tissue is gonna have to heal, it'll undergo fibrosis, and then eventually, you'll narrow this dang esophageal lumen and lead to strictures. So that's another potential complication is strictures. The next thing that I also want you guys to be wary of in patients who have esophagitis, this is probably the most scary complication associated with esophagitis, and especially with a very particular type, we'll talk about it later, called caustic-induced esophagitis, is it's literally the agents are so strong it can rip a hole through the esophagus. And this is called esophageal perforation. So esophageal perforation is a really, really scary complication. Now, with that being said, what are the scary, scary features associated with an esophageal perforation? If you perf this sucker, you can cause air to enter into the mediastinum. You can cause inf like a lot of different agents to move into the mediastinum. This can literally lead to a patient becoming septic. So you really wanna watch out for any kind of scary risk of infections, but most concerning, is a septic patient. This patient can have an increased white blood cell count, fever, hypotension, it's terrifying, so watch out for that. The last thing is if you are ulcerating and eroding and tearing through the esophageal mucosa, guess what's just beneath in the submucosa? Blood vessels. If you rip into them, blood starts leaking into the esophageal lumen, you're gonna poop out black and you're gonna freak out. So watch out for GI bleeding as well. So again, the complications associated with esophagitis include strictures, esophageal perforation, which can increase the risk of infections and sepsis, or you can also have a GI bleed. Now let's talk about what are the causes of the esophageal inflammation. All right, so esophagitis, we got an inflamed esophagus. Again, the patient will present with odynophagia, dysphagia, retrosternal chest pain, dyspepsia. The scary complications include strictures, a perforation, and as well as watch out for GI bleeding. Now, what are the reasons that esophagus is all jacked up and inflamed? Well, you pay the price when you have esophagitis. All right, I know it's corny, but that's the mnemonic, price. So what does this include? This is pill-induced esophagitis is the first one. Okay, so pill-induced esophagitis. The next one is reflux esophagitis. So again, reflux esophagitis. The next one is infectious esophagitis. Again, infectious esophagitis. The next one here is gonna be a nasty, scary one called caustic esophagitis. Again, caustic esophagitis. And the last one here is gonna be eosinophilic esophagitis. 
Okay, my friends, so again, eosinophilic esophagitis. So with all of that being said, what do we got? We got price, pill-induced esophagitis, reflux esophagitis, infectious esophagitis, caustic esophagitis, and eosinophilic esophagitis. All right, for pill-induced, you gotta ask yourself the question, what's the pills that you're taking, bro, that's causing all these problems? Well, the pills that are usually the issue here, there's a couple of them. So what you wanna look for in the history is things like NSAIDs, doxycycline, potassium chloride, and bisphosphonates. These are usually the triggers. Okay, so again, NSAIDs, potassium chloride, doxycycline, bisphosphonates. The chemical comp capacity of these drugs have the ability, if again, if not taken with enough water, if they get stuck there, they have the ability to injure the mucosa and cause massive inflammation. The next one is reflux esophagitis. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what are the particular <laughs> uh, history features that you want to be able to pick up for this patient. This is a patient who has gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it's usually the patient with GERD who's kind of like having a lot of problems with PPIs. They're not really kind of responding appropriately to this. So it's usually refractory GERD. That hydrochloric acid is tearing up the esophagus. We talked about that in the GERD lecture. The next one is an infectious esophagitis. Here's the thing, with this one, you have to look in the clinical vignette for the patient to be immunocompromised. And usually the easiest way for that to be presented is a patient with HIV, who then, because they're immunocompromised, they're more susceptible to infections that normal people would not get, CMV, HSV, and Candida. Okay, so again, if a patient has infectious esophagitis, they are usually immunocompromised, usually HIV positive, which increases them getting the risk of CMV esophagitis, HSV esophagitis, and Candida esophagitis. Okay, we come down to the next one here, caustic esophagitis. This one absolutely terrifies me. If I ever see a patient with this one, it's you're gonna wanna run because these patients can get super, super sick on you. This is the ones that can literally perf their esophagus. Usually the cause is, it's usually an event of kind of a suicide attempt, unfortunately, where they drink something like a strong acid or a strong base, and they just cause massive necrosis and eschars of the esophagus. So you wanna watch out for things like strong acids and strong base, but here's the thing, they're usually drinking it. And so if you drink something like that, it's gonna burn up the oral cavity, it's gonna burn up the pharynx, it's gonna burn up the larynx, and it may even get into their airway a little bit too. So they'll have features of esophagitis and upper airway problems. So watch out for strong acid, strong bases, things like oral burns, things like drooling, and things like strider. Okay, again, caustic esophagitis, strong acid, strong base, really tearing up the esophagus, but also will tear up the oral cavity, tear up the pharynx, and tear up the actual upper airway as well in the process. That's a scary one. And again, high risk of perforation. The last one is eosinophilic esophagitis. Eosinophils are infiltrating the esophagus and causing massive amounts of inflammation. What's the trigger? Look for a patient with the atopic triad. I know you know this. It's the patient who has asthma, allergies, and some type of atopic dermatitis. And usually, they eat a particular food, so they have a natural allergy to it, and it triggers an eosinophilic infiltration of the esophagus and inflames that puppy up. So in the vignette, look for atopic triad, and a f the, because of that, they have a food allergy that inflames up the esophagus. So again, this is the big thing to remember for eosinophilic esophagitis. Patient has the atopic triad features, asthma, allergies, dermatitis. They ingest a food allergen, boom, eosinophils infiltrate the esophagus and cause massive inflammation. These are the causes of esophagitis. Now what we have to do is take the patient who comes in with odynophagia, dysphagia, retrosternal chest pain complications and diagnose the esophagitis and the cause of it. Let's get to that. All right, my friends, let's actually start talking about esophagitis. Let's talk about the diagnostic approach and then the treatment. All right, so when we talk about esophagitis, how do we actually go about diagno diagnosing esophagitis? Well, the first thing that you have to ask yourself, because I told you esophagitis is one of the scariest complications that can have a high mortality rate is esophageal perforation. You can perf, you can end up with a lot of scary things such as 
a pneumomediastinum. You can have subcutaneous emphysema. You can have really scary infections, so the patient can become septic. If you see these, you need to do what? Well, you need to go ahead and get a contrast esophagram. And what they do is they give them something called gastrographin and they look for, do they see an area of leak or perforation within the esophagus? And there she below. You can also consider a CT chest as well to kind of get a good look at that as well. Now, if you have no features of esophageal perforation, then what do you do? You get an EGD with a biopsy potentially. Now, once you get an EGD, this is gonna kind of pretty much lead you right into what the particular cause is. Remember price. So first thing is, do you see any pill fragments or any ulcers? This is pill-induced esophagitis. Do you see any history of GERD that is suggestive or any erosive esophagitis? This could be reflux esophagitis, but here's the big one. Is the patient immunocompromised? Remember, HIV positive. If they are, what do you do? Think about infectious esophagitis. Now, remember, we said that there was three types. If you see things like very large, nasty, huge ulcers like this, and then on the biopsy it shows cytomegaly with inclusion bodies, this is characteristic of CMV esophagitis. Whenever you have a patient who has a suggestive of, of, of CMV esophagitis, you really wanna send off what's called viral cultures because sometimes you have antivirals that are not basically good enough to fight off the CMV, like gancyclovir. You wanna see if they have gancyclovir resistance. The next thing that you wanna do is, do you see any white plaques that are raised? Do you see any hyphae on biopsy? This is suggestive of candida esophagitis. Then, do you see any small rounded herpetic vesicles, any giant cells with Caudry A inclusion bodies on the biopsy? Also look, in candida esophagitis, they may have oral thrush. In HSV esophagitis, they may have oral ulcers. In this, again, think about HSV esophagitis. All right. Whenever you have a patient who has HSV esophagitis, you want to obtain viral cultures again because you want to make sure, is there any antivirals that are sensitive to this, particularly acyclovir? I want to know if the HSV is acyclovir resistant, just like I get viral cultures for a CMV to see if the CMV is gancyclovir resistant. All right, beautiful. Now, do they have any esophageal eschars? Do they have any perforation, any fistula? This is the patient you really wanna be scared of with caustic esophagitis. And then lastly, is there any esophageal rings that you see with mucosal fragility? Any etraepithelial eosinophils? This is classic, my friends, of eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, with all of this, this is kind of looking at what the EGD shows you. Use your history. In pill-induced esophagitis, what was the big particular things that you'll see in the clinical vignette? NSAIDs, bisphosphonates, doxycycline, potassium chloride. And the caustic, this was due to strong acids and strong bases. But how will the patient present? Oral drooling, burns, uh, oral burns, drooling, and strider. And the last one is the eosinophilic esophagitis. What is the big triad? the atopic triad. And one really high yield fact that you'll see here is that these patients tend to be very resistant to PPIs. They still complain of dysphagia or dinophagia and that GERD symptoms with resistance to PPIs. This is classic, my friends. All right, now we gotta treat the esophagitis. How do we treat this? Well, remember, in all of these, you really just wanna prevent any further esophagitis. And how do I do that? put them on a PPI. Everyone who has esophagitis, just get them on a PPI to prevent any further esophagitis progression. Then treat the cause. Is it an esophageal perforation? You have to identify this off the contrast esophagram or the CT of the chest. If there is, you need to intubate this patient, put an NG tube in, consider some antibiotics, broad spectrum, and you may even need to do what's called an esophagectomy. If there isn't, then go through the price causes. Is there pill-induced esophagitis? Okay, discontinue the offending medications or just make sure that they take it with a full glass of water so it doesn't get stuck in their esophagus. Is the reflux esophagitis? We already talked about this in GERD. Treat the GERD. Try to give things that increase the lower esophageal sphincter tone, decrease intragastric pressure, decrease hydrochloric acid production, and then also treat the hiatal hernia if you need to. And then Nissen's fund applications for the refractory cases. Do they have infectious esophagitis? This is high yield, my friends. If it's CMV, you treat them with gancyclovir. If they have resistance to it, you give them phoscarnet. Do they have HSV? You treat them with acyclovir. Do they have resistance to it? You give them phoscarnet. That's the purpose of the viral cultures. And the last one is, do they have candida? You treat them with fluconazole or amphotericin B. All right. 
Do they have caustic esophagitis? Very, very high yield. Because again, big complication is esophageal perforation. But what do you do to the caustic esophagitis? It's all supportive care that we talked about here. But you want to remember this. Do not induce emesis. It'll worsen the esophagitis and do not attempt to neutralize the acid or base. It'll worsen the esophagitis. Very, very high yield. And then lastly is eosinophilic esophagitis. How do we treat this one? With this one, you have to remove the offending factor. Get rid of the food allergens and then treat these patients again with fluticasone propionate. Spray it into their mouth because it's a corticosteroid and it'll reduce the eosinophilic response. All right, my friends, in this video, we talk about esophagitis. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I love you. Thank you. And as always, until next time.